Princess Elizabeth Alexandra Mary was born on the 21st of April in 1926 to her mother Elizabeth and father Albert. She was given the nickname Lilibet by her close family and was adored by her grandfather King George, who she affectionately called Grandpa England. At a young age, she was seen by many as a sensible and level-headed child. The future Prime Minister Winston Churchill commented that even as a child, Elizabeth had an astonishing air of authority and reflectiveness. But Elizabeth's life was quite closed off from the outside world. She was educated at home alongside her little sister, Margaret. The princess's life was meant to be a calm and quiet one, living here in the town of Windsor. But that all changed in 1936, when her uncle Edward, the King of England, decided he didn't want to rule anymore. I discharged my last duty as King and Emperor. All eyes now turned to Elizabeth's father. As second in line to the throne, it was his duty to take up the role his brother had refused. And now that I have been succeeded by my brother, my first words must be to declare my allegiance to him. And so he was crowned King George VI. Once her father became king, Elizabeth's peaceful life in Windsor was transported somewhere a little less quiet. You might recognise this place, Buckingham Palace. Elizabeth was immediately thrust into the spotlight as her father's heir and the future queen. Her education was taken over by a teacher from a very famous school called Eton College. She was taught history, music and languages, everything to prepare for her life as a future monarch. But Elizabeth didn't have long to settle into this new life. On the 3rd of September 1939, the King made one of the most important announcements in the UK's history. For the second time in the lives of most of us, we are at war. There may be dark days ahead and war can no longer be confined to the battlefield. This speech marked the beginning of the Second World War. For people here in Britain, they were now locked in a terrifying conflict with Germany for the second time in 20 years. And that war took place right here on Elizabeth's doorstep. So it's goodbye to the cities and danger areas, labelled and loaded and not forgetting their gas masks. The children head for the special train. And they're not worrying, they're off on a holiday. In the first few days of the war, 1.5 million children were evacuated from urban areas to the countryside. This was to protect them from attacks on major cities like London, Liverpool and Belfast. Elizabeth and her sister were also evacuees during the war. and They were taken to royal palaces like this one, Windsor Castle and also Balmoral in Scotland to try and stay safe. The sisters were separated from their parents, who chose to stay in London. King George was determined to show his loyalty to the people who remained in the UK cities. While some evacuees were excited about going on an adventure to a new home, many struggled to be away from their families. I've come to Ipswich to meet Charlie and his grandma Heather. Heather was one of the millions of children who were evacuated during the Second World War. Charlie wanted me to meet his grandma to find out more about what that time was like for her. I was a, a young child and as young children we had to be moved from our families to another family which was out of danger from the war. My mother took me to the station one day and I had my best coat on and a hat which I didn't like too much and my gas mask around my neck and a label which said who I was and there were lots of other children I didn't know. And I thought my mother was going to get on this train with me but she wasn't allowed to do that. Right at the end of the war, really, I must have been about eight or nine, and there was a four-day agreement with the Germans that they wouldn't bomb for the four days over Christmas. And um, I had a lovely Christmas day with 
Christmas presents in a stocking, I can remember that, until it got to Boxing Day. And then suddenly we heard planes coming over the house and we thought, right, it's going to fall the bomb on our heads. But it didn't fall on our heads. It fell two doors up. So we were very lucky not to forget being killed. Charlie, to hear a story like this firsthand from your nana, how does it make you feel? It makes me feel so sad. She had to go through all that. If I went through that, I wouldn't imagine what state I'd be in. And we've got to be grateful for today with what we have and, and what they didn't have. In 1940, just a year after the war began, 14-year-old Elizabeth delivered her very first public broadcast on the radio to the children of the United Kingdom. My sister Margaret Rose and I feel so much for you, as we know from experience what it means to be away from those we love most of all. So Princess Elizabeth and her sister sent a message to all the children who'd been evacuated throughout the war. Why do you think that was important? Because I think it tells people uh, that it doesn't matter uh, who you are. You're all involved in something. You're all suffering the same way. And, and then that makes you say, well, we must get together and be strong. And I think that's the message, to be strong. As the years went by, Elizabeth wanted to play a bigger part in the war effort. She trained to become a mechanic and learned to drive trucks and ambulances. Her father cheered her on. The king returned and jokingly asked the princess, haven't you got it mended yet? And finally, after six long years, the war came to an end in Europe on the 8th of May, 1945. Elizabeth and her family greeted the huge crowds that came to celebrate outside Buckingham Palace. We may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing. Today is victory in Europe day. A lot of happiness came in the years that followed for Princess Elizabeth. At 20 years old, she became engaged to her first love, Philip Mountbatten, a prince of both Greek and Danish royalty. They were married at Westminster Abbey as thousands celebrated outside. A nation and a world watch. Once only in 1100 years of British kingship has there been such a day. An heiress presumptive to the throne marries the man of her choice. While the war was over, the effects of the war were not. Britain was poor and still relied on rations for food and clothes. Elizabeth used coupons to buy the material for her wedding dress and did her own makeup on the day. Just a year after the wedding, Elizabeth gave birth to the first of her four children and the future heir to the throne, Prince Charles. Having spent her teenage years living in the shadow of a war, it seemed Elizabeth had finally found peace, but sadly, it didn't last. In February 1952, Elizabeth's beloved father suddenly passed away. Elizabeth was visiting Kenya at the time on an official royal tour. Prince Philip broke the news to her in private. In just a matter of minutes, Elizabeth's life was turned on its head once more. She was only 25 years old. Now the Princess Elizabeth we knew and loved returns amongst us as our queen. Elizabeth returned to the UK immediately, where she threw herself into her new role. On the 2nd of June, 1953, Elizabeth found herself walking up the steps once again here at Westminster Abbey, but this time it was for a very different reason. The Archbishop performs the simple, yet the most significant ceremony of the Queen's coronation. Men from nearly 50 lands over which the Queen holds sway are united in the mammoth parade that is the Empire's tribute to their sovereign lady. And with what pride shall those who watch recall in after years 
I saw the Queen on Coronation Day. Queen Elizabeth's coronation was televised live, something that had never been done before. Millions of people from all over the world tuned in. Some even bought their very first TV set just so they could watch it. When the Queen came to the throne 70 years ago, the world was a different place. There were still many countries in the British Empire that were run by the UK with the Queen as their head. But it was also a time of big change. Many people in those countries wanted to be independent, where they would run things themselves. These countries decided to leave the British Empire. But their link to Britain remained through an organisation called the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth was and is meant to be a bond of friendship between all the different countries, most of them former British colonies. After the Second World War, many people from those countries were encouraged to find work here in Britain. In 1948, 500 people from the Caribbean travelled more than 4,000 miles on a ship called the Empire Windrush. They hoped for a new and exciting life here in the UK and thought they would be welcomed with open arms. But instead, many were met with racism and rejection. I've come to Manchester to meet Bay and her grandmother Enith. Hey guys, how are you doing? Enith came to the UK from the Caribbean country of St Kitts and Nevis in the 1960s and Bay wanted me to hear her story. It was very strange because when you're in the West Indies it's just sunshine, blue skies, everyone was laid back and then to come to England it was a shock because was expecting something different, but not as cold and as dark and as damp. You know, I just thought that it would be sunshine and a bit like the West Indies. Were there any challenges for you at school? Well, I was very scared because I didn't know anything and I felt a bit nervous as well because the children in my class, they stared and pointed because we didn't have a lot of Caribbean in our class at the time. My careers teacher, said that I could only work in a shop. In my eyes, I could do better. So I don't understand why she would have said that apart from my colour of my skin. Eventually, I did have my own business and I felt so proud. I just wanted to go and say I did better than what you expected. Why is the allotment so important to you? My parents coming from West Indies, they used to have their own land there and grow a lot of the vegetables. We grew callaloo, pumpkin, pear, and all those things we had back in the West Indies. It reminds me of so much about home. Ian, if you actually learned a lot about the Queen before you came here to England, didn't you? We always used to say that England was our motherland and and then one day they decide, well, the Queen was coming to Nevis. What? So we had to get our clean uniforms on um, and we had flags and they drove past. You know, when we were waving our flags, it was like she was looking at me, not everybody else, just me. And she had such a beautiful smile. And I thought she was a very special person. The Queen had to find a way to manage the relationships between Commonwealth countries and Britain, and this was one of her biggest challenges at the start of her reign. But her first tour as Queen to Commonwealth countries like Australia, Jamaica and New Zealand proved just how popular she was. It was a huge success for her and her family. Following her tour, the Queen continued to be a reliable figure in public life. From 1952 to 1979, she saw eight prime ministers come and go and met with powerful leaders from all over the world. By the 1980s, the world had changed beyond recognition. This was the decade that saw the introduction of all kinds of new tech like mobile phones, personal computers and game consoles. While the UK was looking unrecognisable compared to when the Queen's reign began, the monarchy seemed to be as popular as ever. 
And at the start of the 1980s, there was a particularly special event that the Queen could celebrate. There was to be a royal wedding. The Queen's oldest son and heir to the throne, Prince Charles, was getting married to Lady Diana Spencer. Their engagement made headlines around the world. The couple shared their news in a special interview. I'm amazed that she's uh, been brave enough to take me on. <laughs> and I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> so. Soon, wedding fever hit the nation. And it was a fairy tale wedding, watched by 750 million people in 74 countries around the world. A public holiday was declared in the UK. A crowd of 600,000 turned out to line the streets of London, cheering the bride and groom. The following year, Diana gave birth to a son. They called him William. To the outside world, Charles and Diana's marriage seemed happy at first, but soon cracks began to appear. Speculation about their relationship made headlines across tabloid newspapers and TV. The Queen carried on her public duties, aware of the negative attention that the royal family was receiving from the British press. It seemed that the royal family's popularity, which had once been unshakable, was beginning to crumble. In 1992, the Queen's 40th year as monarch, she faced some of her greatest challenges yet. It was a year in which three of her children separated from their partners, including Prince Charles from Diana. As the press continued to publish negative stories about the royals, tragedy struck closer to home. Hello, more than 100 firefighters are tackling a huge blaze at Windsor Castle. In the days following the fire, the Queen called 1992 her Annus Horribilis, which in Latin means horrible year. In a speech, she asked for the public and the press to show some kindness to the family at a difficult time. There can be no doubt, of course, that criticism is good for people and institutions that are part of public life. That scrutiny by one part of another can be just as effective if it is made with a touch of gentleness, good humour and understanding. Finally, in 1995, Charles asked Diana for a divorce. Despite being freed from royal responsibilities, Diana was still hounded by the press. She rose to the pressures of being in the public eye, using her publicity to bring attention to causes and charities she cared about. But in 1997, Diana's life was cut tragically short. Buckingham Palace has confirmed the death of Diana, Princess of Wales. The princess died following a car crash in Paris. People around the world were devastated. She was the people's princess. And that's how she will stay, how she will remain in our hearts and in our memories forever. Far away from London, the Queen chose to keep out of the public eye, instead choosing to support her grandchildren, Prince William and Prince Harry, who were devastated after the death of their mum. While the Queen's intentions were to support her family, her silence was criticised by the public. They felt that she should be joining with them in their grief. To many, it seemed as though the Queen was hiding away. At 20 past two this afternoon, the one basic thing people in the crowds here had been calling for all week took place. The Queen came back to Buckingham Palace. I'm very glad that she's come here. I feel very sad for her and I think none of us can really know how she's feeling at the moment. Later that day, the Queen delivered an emotional message to the British people. I want to pay tribute to Diana myself. She was an exceptional and gifted human being. I hope that tomorrow we can all, wherever we are, join in expressing our grief at Diana's loss and gratitude for her all too short life. As the years went by, the royal family's relationship with the public slowly improved. 
In 2011, the nation rejoiced as Prince William married his long-term girlfriend, Catherine Middleton, in a grand ceremony at Westminster Abbey. It really has been an incredible day. About half an hour ago, the crowds here and the world finally got to see what they were waiting for, the, the kiss. kiss. And the following year, the UK celebrated a summer of sport with the start of the London Olympic Games. To the joy of those watching, the Queen, alongside her beloved Corgis, had a starring role in the opening ceremony. <clears throat> Good evening, Mr Bond. Good evening, Your Majesty. 2012 also marked the Queen's Diamond Jubilee, a milestone of 60 years on the throne. The Queen was celebrated as one of the most beloved figureheads in the history of the royal family. And in September 2015, she broke the record for the longest serving monarch in British history, having at that point reigned for more than 23,227 days. Finally, in 2018, there was even more cause for celebration when Prince Harry walked down the aisle with Meghan Markle. But these celebrations were short-lived. Not long after his marriage to Meghan, Prince Harry decided it was time to leave his life as a royal behind, saying he felt he didn't have enough support within his family. He and Meghan moved with their son to the United States to live as private citizens. And just a few months after their departure, the UK faced an altogether new and unexpected challenge. First up, the government have announced big changes, meaning that most of you won't be going to school next week. A disease called coronavirus was spreading rapidly, and the government asked many people in the UK to stay at home to help limit its spread. The Queen made an important address to the nation. I'm speaking to you at what I know is an increasingly challenging time. A time of disruption in the life of our country. A disruption that has brought grief to some financial difficulties to many, and enormous changes to the daily lives of us all. Millions of people in the UK were unable to self-isolate when the pandemic started. Instead, they were on the front line of the war against this virus. They were postal workers, social workers, teachers, and of course, doctors and nurses. I've come here to meet Olivia. She's a family friend of Felicia Kwaku, a chief nurse here at King's College Hospital. Felicia worked tirelessly throughout the pandemic to support her black, Asian and ethnic minority colleagues. She received an OBE from the Queen for her amazing work. This was the first time that any of us had really experienced a global pandemic. It was really hard sometimes. Sometimes you didn't even know how you were going to make it through the day and where your strength was coming from. So teamwork got, got us through. You got an OBE. So what even is an OBE? Well, um, OBE, Livy, stands for the most excellent order of the British Empire. And it's a recognition and honour given to people um, from the Queen. And I received the OBE for services to nursing during the COVID-19 pandemic. And for me, getting the OBE was probably the highlight of my life. But it's not just for me, it was for all the nurses and the midwives that died and became very sick during COVID. So Felicia, it must have been so special for you to be honoured by the Queen. It's a privilege to know um, that she had our backs and that she was thinking about us and that that thinking is really her care, showing us her care. And she expressed her support for us healthcare staff in the NHS and across the country. That's special. In 2020, nearly 1,500 people like Felicia were recognised for their services during the pandemic in the Queen's birthday honours. These honours were a way of celebrating the dedication and sacrifices of frontline workers during one of the most critical times in the UK's recent history. But unfortunately, an even greater challenge was to come for the Queen. It was with great sadness that a short time ago, I received word from Buckingham Palace that His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh, has passed away at the age of 99. The Queen's beloved husband of more than 70 years had died. At a time when the nation was still wrestling with the pandemic, the Queen did what she had always done, 
she showed solidarity with her people, even in her time of grief. At the Duke's funeral, she sat alone, separate to her family, in the chapel of Windsor Castle, following the social distancing rules that were in place at the time. This moving image of the Queen touched so many people here in the UK who had to face their own challenges and sadness during the pandemic. It served as a reminder of the Queen's dedication to her country. At Prince Philip's funeral, she may have been sat apart from her family, but in spirit, she stood with the people of the United Kingdom. The Queen often refers to herself not as a ruler, but as a servant to her people. And when she was just 21 years old, even before her reign had begun, she made a promise to the people of the United Kingdom. I welcome the opportunity to speak to all the peoples of the British Commonwealth and Empire, wherever they live, whatever race they come from, and whatever language they speak. This is a happy day for me, but it is also one that brings serious thoughts thoughts of life looming ahead with all its challenges and with all its opportunity. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. She may not have been born to be queen, but many would say it was her destiny to become one.